My name is Sue Lynch and I'm a professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology. And I also have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine. So if you joined us last week, you would have heard about some of the newer technologies in the field of human microbiome research that are permitting unprecedented insights into the diversity of microbes that call the human body their home. And tonight you'll hear about efforts to leverage these really rich microbial data sets to predict health outcomes, a very exciting um, field of research within the over, overall field of human microbiome research. And so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Marina Sirota. Marina is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute here at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research program focuses on developing new computational methods in integrative biology and applying these methods to discover novel diagnostic and therapeutic strategies for complex diseases. Her work in computational drug discovery spans everything from Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis to cancer, preterm birth and the role of the immune system in pregnancy. She has a, a PhD in biomedical informatics from Stanford University, but we managed to, to convince her to move up the peninsula to join us at UCSF. And even as a young leader in the field, she's received many awards, um, including the American Medical uh, Informatics Association's Young Investigator Award back in 2017. And so our lecture tonight is entitled, Can Big Microbiome Data Save the World? Using AI and microbiome data to predict health outcomes. Marina, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you and thank you for the kind introduction. It is my pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit about our work leveraging data to better understand disease. But before I get into the science of it, I always like to start by telling folks why I'm excited to be a computational biologist today. And one of the reasons is that, that there's so much data out there that I often feel like a kid in the candy store. These are just some examples of public data sets. So whenever a researcher publishes on a study or generates a data set that's funded by NIH or many, even many other organizations, we have to make the data that we generate publicly available. And that really provides a tremendous resource to the community. These are some examples of those data. For instance, the Cancer Genome Atlas is a data set of over 10,000 cancer samples that have been profiled with a variety of different technologies. So genetics, um, transcriptomics, which is gene expression, whether certain genes are turned on or turned off, methylation, and many other measurements. The 1,000 genomes data is actually many more than 1,000 now, but it's a reference genetic data set of different, of genomes from individuals from different uh, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, there are clinical trial data sets, such as import, which capture information from clinical trials. There is uh, data repositories for gene expression, for instance, the gene expression omnibus. And there are many, many others. These are, again, just some examples. But it gives you an idea of these rich data sets that are available to computational research. Well, to everybody. Uh, but very exciting for us as computational researchers specifically. The cost of sequencing has gone down tremendously in the last 20 years, but also has the cost of computation. So these devices that we have, our phones, are much, much more powerful than computers were only a few years ago. And it is the intersection of these two, of biology and computation, that really allows us to ask very exciting questions. As a result of all this, people are starting to come up with creative ways to use these technologies. So we've been able to profile genomics and transcriptomics, which is genomics is the genome, the DNA. The transcriptomics is which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off, or the RNA. But we can look at the antibody repertoire. We can look at epigenetics or modifications of the genome. We can look at proteomics. And finally, the microbiome, which will be the focus of um, our discussion today. But also, many of these technologies, especially genomics and transcriptomics, we can now capture on a single cell level, which provides another level of resolution and also complexity on the analytical side as well. 
So all this data provides an amazing opportunity to apply artificial intelligence approaches. And this term gets thrown around a lot. So I thought I'd define it. Artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science that deals with simulation of intelligent behavior in computers, where the computer can start learning from a model or from data and making predictions and making certain decisions. This is the idea that a machine might have a capability to imitate intelligent human behavior. And there's many different examples of this. Visual perception and um, analysis of imaging and video data is one example. Speech recognition, being able to listen to what I'm saying right now and translate it into machine readable text. Translation between languages. And finally, decision-making, including clinical decision-making. Machine learning is a sub-branch of artificial intelligence. And I thought I would define that as well. So we know that computers are really good at following instructions, that we can program specific steps. So for instance, you can run a spell checker on a document. Everybody is familiar with that. But what if a certain task is too difficult to describe with a number of steps? For example, let's say you have a letter and you have some handwritten address and you want to learn what does that handwriting actually mean to translate from handwriting to machine read readable text, which is shown here. And these are a few slides that are actually borrowed from my husband who does quite a bit of teaching or used to do quite a bit of teaching uh, on the machine learning and uh, AI side. Another example is digit recognition. Many tasks, again, are not really easy to describe at the level of individual instructions. And we as humans, we can recognize handwritten digits pretty well because we've seen so many examples. So the question is, how can we teach a computer to do the same, to learn from data? And this is really incredibly powerful in many, many different areas. So machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence that provides computers with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed or without being told explicitly what steps need to take place. It focuses on development of a computer program that can change when it's exposed to new data. So these are types of algorithms and types of methods that can learn on the fly. Some examples are recommender systems, Many of you, I'm sure, have Netflix accounts. And you can notice that as you watch more movies, the recommendations, hopefully, the recommendations that the system recommends make more sense and might be more adapted to you. Same thing with your shopping history at Amazon. Image processing, as I mentioned, uh, is another great example of how machine learning has been applied. Looking for objects and recognizing what those objects are is quite important and valuable. And finally, there are many biomedical applications. Artificial intelligence has truly transformed our everyday life. Probably many, many of the apps that you use day to day, including Google Maps, Yelp, um, Uber, you name it, use machine learning as their underlying systems. But the question is, how can we use these data-driven approaches, statistical approaches, machine learning, AI approaches in biomedicine? And this is really what my lab focuses on. We're interested in figuring out how can we use computation and data to better understand health and disease across the lifespan. And we work in a number of different disease areas, starting from very early from pregnancy outcomes and preterm birth, why are babies born early? We study autoimmune disease, uh, conditions such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. So why does the immune system turn against itself? We've done work in cancer immunology, organ transplant, and have recently also started working a bit in neurodegeneration. And a theme that we carry across all of these projects is we're really interested in focusing on the role of the immune system in disease. So today I'm gonna to tell you 
a story about how we've gone about studying pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes. Preterm birth is defined as live birth before week 37 of gestation. And worldwide, about 15 million babies are born preterm. One million of these infants die within the first 28 days of life. And in nearly half of these cases, we don't know why the mom goes into labor early. In many of these babies, there are of course lifelong uh, complications as well. There are many potential mechanisms that have been associated with preterm birth and specifically spontaneous preterm birth. These include infection, stress, breakdown of the maternal fetal tolerance or the interplay between the immune system of the mom and the immune system of the baby. There are potentially some structural reasons like uterine overdistension or cervical disease, cervical insufficiency. And of course, hormones play a huge role, such as progesterone. There are also vascular disorders that have been associated with preterm birth. So there's um, many, many different factors. We decided to approach this problem from a perspective of many, many different types of data. We've looked into the role of genetics in preterm birth. Uh, we know from previous studies that women who are themselves born preterm are more likely to have a preterm baby. And also, uh, for instance, siblings have a higher chance. If, for instance, somebody's sister delivers preterm, they also have a higher chance of delivering preterm. In our own hands, we haven't been able to elucidate uh, a very strong genetic signal. It could be because our sample size was too small, or maybe we were looking at a population that was too heterogeneous. The effects that we saw were fairly small. We've been looking into environmental exposures and the roles that the environment might have in the context of adverse pregnancy outcomes. And there we found that certain water contaminants like arsenic and nitrate might be associated with preterm birth. We've looked at transcriptomics or gene expression, which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off in moms who end up delivering preterm. And we see a lot of immune system misregulation. Interestingly, we see that the maternal immune system has an effect that is opposite of what we see in the babies. So there might be some compensation or some breakdown of the fetal maternal tolerance that we can observe. And this is something that we ex we're exploring further. We've also used these, these gene expression or profiles of genes that are turned on and genes that are turned off to try and discover new therapeutic targets and new interventions to um, prevent preterm birth. We are doing quite a bit of work looking at the electronic medical record, and I will touch on that very briefly at the end. But again, the focus of our discussion today is looking at the microbiome. And this is just a graph showing the abundance of microbiome data in the public domain. And you can see that it has grown exponentially in the last, this ends in 2016, so now we're in 2022. So in the last 20 or so years, and this, this curve has continued to rise. This provides many challenges as well as opportunities. Because of the way the data is generated, there are many considerations uh, and potential biases many knobs to tweak in the way these data are generated experimentally. So it's impossible to combine it on the level of process data. We need to go back to the raw sequencing reads to be able to aggregate this data effectively. Sometimes sample metadata is difficult to get access to. Again, there are both positive and negative aspects of using data from the public domain. The positive is it's free, it's out there for us to use. The negative could be that maybe there are mistakes in the annotation and we can't really go back to the actual patients and the clinical data to verify exactly uh, what the annotations represent and what the samples represent. But in my group, we use the public data to generate hypotheses and then 
we focus with smaller cohort studies with collaborators, with clinical collaborators, to be able to validate and dive into the biology further. So again, it's an amazing opportunity. There's a lot of data out there, but there are also challenges. As I mentioned, there are many different biases in the way that this data is generated. There are different ways to capture microbiome data. There is 16S versus whole genome sequencing. The analysis can be done on a taxonomical level or on a gene level. The samples might have been collected differently, but they've also might have gone quality control and preparation in a different manner. If we focus on 16S, which is uh, a single gene that, that gets sequenced uh, to look at microbial diversity and different microbes, there are different primers that can be used, so different regions of the 16S gene that can be sequenced. And finally, cohort designs are different, study designs. Some cohorts are longitudinal, some are case control, and this makes it all very challenging as well as interesting to figure out how to combine these data effectively. So we started out uh, by querying the public data for available microbiome data sets. And this is what we came up with. There were six studies total uh, that we looked at and HMP, the Human Microbiome Project is kind of a reference data set. So you can think of that, as, think of it as that. You can see, uh, the majority of them focused on maternal microbiome, but some looked at the baby as well. And also, you can see the number of subjects as well as different body sites. Uh, you can see uh, that the majority of these were, cover, co were profiled with 16S. And then you can see that the sampling actually was done differently. So some were weekly sampling, some were just at delivery, somewhere across the different trimesters. So we developed a pipeline, and this was work done by a very talented postdoc in my lab, Edith Costi, uh, that started out with raw reads and the metadata. We map these using a program called UPARS uh, into, to assign taxonomy into what we call operational taxonomical units. And you can think of those as microbial species. And then we can get to statistical analysis, which is for a computational person like myself, that's the fun part. To give you an idea of the size of these data, they're pretty big, especially if you start with the raw sequencing reads. So this is pretty time consuming and computationally intensive. This is what the data looks like. And uh, here each dot is a sample. And what I'm showing is a dimensionality reduction plot, a TSNI plot. And this contains over 10,000 samples, about 12,000 OTUs uh, that then get filtered down to about 1,000 that are mo more common across all of these individual uh, samples. And what they're colored by here are body, body site. You can see that these are microbial samples that are collected in different body sites. Some are skin. There's a lot of vaginal microbiome data, stool, urine, um, oral microbiome, and so forth. And you can see that they really cluster by body site, which is not surprising. These kind of long tails, uh, we were first a little bit surprised to see them, but when we dug into the data a little bit deeper, we saw that these are actually the longitudinal sampling uh, that we were talking about before. So that sort of made sense to us. So the question that we were interested in asking is, can we identify new microbial species that are associated with preterm birth in a longitudinal manner using public data? So bacterial vaginosis is a known risk factor for preterm birth. It's a state of overgrowth of anaerobic bacteria replacing the normal vaginal lactobacillus. Bacterial vaginosis has been shown to increase the risk for preterm birth. And there have been several microbiome studies that have been carried out to date, but no meta-analysis. Nobody has brought these studies together to look for consistency. So this is what we set out to do. This was over 3,000 samples across over 350 women. You can see the five studies that we integrated, the total number of patients per study, 
as well as, uh, again, the, the sampling time. So some were weekly sampling, some were once per trimester. So it's, it's different for, for the different studies that we looked at. By bringing these studies together, we get more statistical power. So we, we have more power to identify significant associations. And also we can get a more diverse cohort if we aggregate all the data together. You can see this is the demographic distribution across the five data sets. And we, when we combine them in a meta-analysis, we see a more even distribution across the different groups. It's still not perfect, but it's better than, than the individual studies alone. So we, and by we, I mean Edith, developed a pipeline to aggregate all of these data. Uh, again, we're starting by mapping them to a closed reference, which means we're comparing to known microbial sequences and are able to generate this matrix of OTUs, which are operational taxonomical units versus samples. We carry out data normalization and batch correction to reduce bias. And this is what the data set focusing on the vaginal microbiome looks like. Uh, again, each dot is a sample. And here they're colored by study. And you can see that there is some structure in the data, but nonetheless, the samples are pretty intermixed. They don't cluster by study specifically. We then apply a weighted linear mixed effects regression model, which allows us to account for many of the other factors that might bring in bias to the equation. And we look at two questions. We're interested in looking at overall diversity or how rich the microbiome is and to look at uh, association analysis. Are there specific species that we can identify as associated with spontaneous preterm birth? So looking at the diversity analysis, this is the same data represented in two different ways. In orange, you have the women who deliver preterm. And in gray, you have women who deliver a term. The y-axis here is diversity, and the x-axis is weeks of gestation. So this is looking at the data longitudinally. And what you can see is that the orange line, as well as on the box plots here on the right-hand side, you can see increased diversity in women who end up delivering preterm. And that increase is significant and strongest in the first trimester, which is pretty exciting from a potentially diagnostic purpose. We saw that this, this result was robust across if we did a stratified analysis in black and white women. So this was consistent across the board, uh, which was very interesting for us to see as well. We then applied, uh, as I mentioned, a linear mixed model, which allows us for every microbial species of interest to look at the trimester of collection, the outcome, model the ethnic background of the individual, as well as random effects that might bring bias to the equation. And this was in collaboration with Svetlana Lailina and Katie Pollard from the Gladstone Institute. So the whole idea is to use this model to be able to capture the fact that different studies have different longitudinal sampling schemes. And this really allows us to adjust for that. When we apply this method, we're able to see that there's a number of species. So here's a heat map showing microbial species on the x-axis and trimester of collection on the y-axis. And we can see these associations. So you see that lactobacillus, which is known, um, is associated, specifically inversely associated. So there's less of lactobacillus in the first trimester, which is expected. And there's more of these other species. Several of them have been shown before, for instance, we know that Gardnerella and Privatella have been associated with spontaneous preterm birth, but by aggregating data, now we're able to identify species that haven't been shown before. For instance, Alcinello and Constridian sensus stricto. So to summarize, 
we're able to recapitulate some of the known associations here. On stepping back and looking at the diversity, we see increased diversity in women who end up delivering preterm, specifically in the first trimester. And also we're able to identify a few novel associations. Again, I think of this as a way to use data to generate hypotheses. And then of course, we need to follow up with additional experiments and validation. So in summary, again, we see increased microbial diversity in women who deliver preterm, and we were able to identify a few novel bacteria uh, from this analysis. And this work was published in Frontiers in Microbiology in 2020, and you're welcome to check it out if you're interested. So this work has really driven us to also figure out how to help uh, the community, the OBGYN community, aggregate data across the board. So one of the efforts that we've been leading in my group um, is creating a preterm birth data repository. And this effort has been funded by an organization called the March of Dimes. The goal of this effort, and it's uh, co-led by myself and Dr. Tomiko Oskotsky, who's a research scientist in my lab, is to aggregate molecular data or omics data across the six March of Dimes trend disciplinary centers. The goal of these centers is to bring scientists from different areas and focus their work on identifying diagnostic and therapeutic strategies to prevent preterm birth. So the data that is being generated across the board is very diverse. It includes gene expression, genomics, a lot of microbiome data, uh, metabolomics. And the idea is that bringing all of these data together will enable new scientific questions and enhance collaboration and coordination across the centers, accelerating the pace of discovery. We launched this effort in 2017 and spun it out in an, to an independent resource in 2020. It's regularly updated with publications and other information. You can see a few screenshots of what it actually looks like. And we also um, wrote a small paper about it uh, that was published in 2018. And this is the link to the data repository. Currently, we have 57 studies. Uh, capturing data on 28,000 participants and almost 40,000 experimental samples. So it's very rich. Uh, and we also track whether this data is being used and it's been downloaded over 4,000 times. So we're hoping the community, both computational and other scientists are leveraging these data to ask new questions. In terms of the different types of data, uh, you can see here by assay type, I don't have it labeled, but one of these bigger square um, kind of pie pieces is actually microbiome data, which uh, has brought us to ask a different question. And we've been investigating ways to bring the computational community to these data. One way to do that is through a crowdsourcing approach. And the idea behind these crowdsourcing approaches is that if you take a data set and make it available to the computational community, we can uh, create a challenge, um, kind of a competition. So what we've been working on is launching a set of dream challenges uh, where the idea is to bring scientists who might not have worked in biomedicine or might not have worked on pregnancy outcomes specifically to these data. Uh, and the question that we're interested in asking is more of a predictive question. Can we predict, can we use these data to predict women who might be at higher risk for preterm birth? So we've started out with a transcriptomics or gene expression dream challenge, which has now been completed and we're currently working on microbiome data. Um, and this is an effort of several folks in my lab, so Tomiko Skotsky and Eleni Roldan, with many, many collaborators uh, across the country. This is the first uh, dream challenge that we launched looking at transcriptomics data. And here we worked very closely with Adi Tarka and his team to see whether researchers can use gene expression to predict which women are at a higher risk for preterm birth. But again, the focus today is microbiome. So most recently, 
We aggregated data on nine studies, so significantly more than what we've done previously. It's a total of almost 6,000 samples and 1,300 participants. And this gives you an idea of the breakdown between uh, the, the preterm versus term, uh, women who delivered preterm versus term. And there are two goals of this dream challenge. Uh, one is prediction of gestational age at sampling. And the second is prediction of preterm birth. So who is uh, more or less likely to deliver preterm? These are the actual data that are going into the modeling. Uh, you can see, again, they come from all over the world. The studies that are highlighted in purple are funded by the March of Dimes and come from several March of Dimes centers, Imperial College of London, WashU, Stanford University, and University of Pennsylvania, as well as we also pull data from the public domain. We've been collaborating with a very talented uh, computational scientist and clinician, Jonathan Golub, who has created a very unique uh, approach to normalizing and aggregating microbiome data. So here, instead of looking at a single sequence at a time and comparing it to a reference sequence for the microbial species, he builds a tree, a phylogenetic tree of these sequences, which means we're looking at relationships between the different sequencing reads and different species in a way uh, to bring all of the data onto the same plane. So here uh, is just showing several of the studies and the, the way that the data looks. Each dot here is a sample, and uh, we're showing both the term and the preterm individuals. And you can see the fact that the sampling strategies are actually quite different across the board. So in gray, uh, you can see gestational day of delivery. In blue are the specimens that are collected from pregnancies that are preterm, and in green are specimens that are collected from pregnancies at term. This is what the full data set looks like. Uh, and this is work uh, jointly by Eleni Roldan, who is a research associate in my lab with, in collaboration with Jonathan. So each dot here is a sample. The data on the left is before normalization and processing with this tree approach that I just mentioned. And you can see that here they clearly cluster by study. So they're colored by study. And you can see that they each study forms a separate cluster. So again, this is a dimensionality reduction and each dot is a sample. However, after the normalization and this process of mapping and um, aligning all the sequences to the same tree, you can see that all the samples are kind of gathered together. And this is on the bottom, the visualization per study. This is a very difficult task computationally, and we were very, very excited to see that the data actually looks quite good. This is the same data, but colored by outcome, term in yellow versus preterm in pink. This is colored by trimester of collection. Unfortunately, we don't have as many first trimester samples, but have quite a bit in second and third trimesters. And finally, this is the same data but uh, colored by race and ethnicity of the individuals. So this is very exciting. We're starting to get into the actual analysis. Uh, this is work by a graduate student in my lab, Alice Tang. Uh, and uh, we're starting to look at diversity. We're able to recapitulate uh, some of the signals that we've seen before. So here, preterm individuals are shown in blue and term individuals are in orange. And you can see again that, that spike in higher diversity in uh, earlier, early in gestation. Uh, this is looking, this heat map is showing concordance across different uh, diversity metrics. And this is looking at matching the cohorts by uh, gestational age at sampling. So this is on the left showing two histograms, again, 
preterm in blue and term in orange. And you can see that there, is, there are some differences, but before we run our predictive models, we want to make sure that these distributions are aligned, which you can see on the right-hand side. In terms of looking at predictive modeling, these are very preliminary results, but you can see that uh, this is a rock curve and random 50-50 chance of prediction would be something on the diagonal. We've tried a number of different uh, approaches, machine learning approaches, and you can see that we can get about 0.7 accuracy, which is not amazing, but at least it's a baseline. And really, I want to stress the idea here is for us to run the baseline analysis and really release this data to the broader computational community to develop approaches that we maybe wouldn't be able to think of ourselves and see how well they can do. So this, those are our next steps with the dream challenge. This is where we are. This is sort of, um, I guess, hot off the press and quite preliminary. We've also been using these data for education purposes. So one of the efforts that I lead also together with uh, Tomiko Oskotsky in, in the lab or at UCSF is this program called AI for All. And the goal is to empower and teach. Uh, we started out with all girls, but now have extended to other groups that are underrepresented in AI, um, high school kids about applications of data science to biomedicine. We have over now 75 alumni. Last year, we had over 200 applicants, and this year, about 150. And we just got our first, uh, our cohort for 2022. And one of the things that the students focus on are research projects. And there was a group last year looking at reproductive health uh, and predicting health outcomes using microbiome data. Uh, looking across body sites. So again, here focusing on pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes and specifically seeing how predictive uh, are not only vaginal microbiome data, but microbiome data across different body sites, including skin, stool, oral microbiome, and so forth. And the students are actually continuing this project throughout the year. So this started last year, but uh, they're still going strong. And we're incredibly lucky to have a number of really talented project TAs, Nana, Alice, Eunice, and Eleni. Um, and Alice and Eleni are part of my team. This program as a whole has been an amazing experience. Uh, we've started it in 2019. So this was our first in-person class. And in 2020, we made the decision to keep the program and turn it virtual. Uh, and we've done the same for 2021. And it will still be virtual this year, though we're hoping that next year we can move to in-person. It's really amazing and exciting what these kids can do in a short period of time. Um, they, uh, in three weeks, they learn about AI and machine learning and approaches like what I mentioned today, clustering and predictive modeling. They learn how to code in Python. Um, there is a number of faculty guest lecturers that present. Uh, there are different panels. They get exposed to industry, graduate school, undergrad students. Um, and then we teach them a little bit about how to communicate, how to communicate about themselves, how to communicate about science. And uh, most excitingly, they work on research projects. In 2020, all of the research projects focused on applications of AI to COVID-19, uh, but across different types of data. So they looked at uh, time series data, proteomics, uh, imaging, so chest x-rays, uh, gene expression, and electronic medical records. And these are just some examples of the figures and the data that they've been able to generate looking at, you know, different types of questions. This is relating to COVID-19. And we've also published a paper on this experience of uh, turning uh, a program virtual and what the students have been able to gain out of it. And we hope this serves as an example to other institutions who want to launch similar programs as well. In summary, there's lots of different types of data, including microbiome data that's available in the public domain. And data sharing is vital and enables amazing opportunities to ask questions. We can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to build predictive models in disease. 
and crowdsourcing approaches or making these data sets available um, to the community is incredibly powerful. The case study that I presented is looking at vaginal microbiome, specifically in preterm birth. And we're also using these types of data to train the next generation of AI biomedical researchers. But before we close off today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the opportunity to leverage clinical data in research. And this is something that we've been um, diving into and exploring for the past few years. Across the UC system, Atul Butte, who's the leader of the Institute, the Baker Computational Health Institute that I'm part of, and also my mentor, uh, has been leading this effort to aggregate clinical data uh, across um, all the, the whole UC system. And this is quite amazing. We've had access to electronic medical record data at UCSF uh, spanning from 2012 to today. It's about 1.3 million patients and includes allergies, diagnosis codes, encounters, immunizations, lab tests, pretty much all the information that's captured when you go to, to see a doctor. And the question that we were interested in asking was, can we use this electronic medical record data to study preterm birth? Why specifically pregnancy outcomes and preterm birth? Well, one, the outcome is readily captured in the electronic medical record. Uh, we know when these women delivered and we have information of what the outcome is. And we also have the information of the outcome of the babies. Secondly, it's a nine month time frame, And more or less, of course, this, there are many caveats. Uh, there is some consistent care. This project was started by a high school student, Carolyn Wang, in the lab under the mentorship of Edith Costi, who was a postdoc at the time. And was uh, the initial um, project was presented at, by Carolyn at the AMIA conference in 2017. So the question was, can we leverage clinical data to study preterm birth? We have almost 15,000 births, 12,000 of them term and 1,300 preterm. And again, a number of different types of data, including diagnosis codes, medications, lab test results, as well as demographics. This is what the population, uh, the clinical data population at UCSF looks like. Uh, you can see the demographics, the age distributions, uh, and roughly equally split between males and females. So we built a trajectory of pregnancy, starting from the outcome and then going backwards. We capture the earliest known date of pregnancy as well as medical history prior to that. There are some measures that are cumulative, including medications and lab tests, and some measures that happen only during the pregnancy itself. Again, we started out with almost 15,000 births there is a, the data is messy. There is a lot of data cleaning. We had pregnancies that lasted several years. We had male patients that were pregnant, where most likely it's the sex of the baby that got miscoded. Um, and so there's a lot of data cleaning that needs to happen. And by the time we're done with that, our data is cut in half. This is not surprising, but nonetheless, this is incredibly rich and it's real patient data. So it makes sense to take advantage of it. We saw some associations that are known. For instance, it is known that preterm birth is more common in uh, African-American women and we were able to recapitulate that and less common in the Asian population. We can see that across the board. We saw that the biggest risk factor for pregnancy, for adverse pregnancy outcomes like preterm birth was prior preterm birth. Uh, obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension are all known risk factors. But we were also able to identify some factors that are interesting and more exciting to incorporate. For instance, generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, hyperthyroidism, all of these are things we're looking into now. We saw by applying machine learning and predictive modeling, this is specific to lab test results and the um, actually the CBC, the complete blood count, which pretty much everybody gets all the time. 
And we see that there is predictive value once we take the CDC data together with demographics, we get uh, an AUC of about 0.77. We've also partnered with Tony Capra, who was at the time at um, Vanderbilt University and doing work that's very, very similar and uh, ended up developing and cross-checking models across two institutions. So uh, we had our cohort at UCSF, Tony and his team, uh, this was work led by Avin Abraham in Tony's lab, had the cohort at Vanderbilt, which was considerably larger. They developed the machine learning predictive models on the Vanderbilt cohort, then sent them to us, and we ran them on the UCSF cohort. And we saw that the performance across these two very different institutions with different patients, different patient demographics, different clinical practice, were fairly consistent across the board. Again, the predictive value is not amazing, but the fact that it's consistent across these two institutions is, is quite impressive. So we're moving uh, forward with not only analyzing data from UCSF, but data across the whole UC system. Uh, this, is, uh, this just gives you an idea of the pregnancy population uh, both, so this is at UCSF now, uh, and then across the whole UC system, we have about almost 150,000 pregnancies with almost 5,000 individuals who delivered preterm. We have information on various types of measurements, um, lab test results, drug exposures, and comorbidities. Um, so it's a lot, a lot of data that uh, we're tackling, and it's very exciting. This is looking at the demographics across the, both the general pregnancy cohort as well as the preterm birth cohort. So we're starting to look at outcome, pregnancy outcome, heterogeneity, and patient heterogeneity, as well as predictive modeling in terms of identifying some of these outcomes. And my hope is that by integrating the molecular piece, so today, again, I talked about microbiome, but we're doing a lot of work uh, in different molecular measurements. Together with some of these clinical uh, data approaches, we can maybe get a little bit closer to precision medicine and helping these women. So with that, I'd like to thank my team. Uh, a lot of the work that I talked about today was done by Edith Costi. She led the microbiome work. The more recent uh, work on the microbiome has been led by Tomiko Skotsky, Eleni Roldan, as well as Alice Tang. Um, Guy Andraletti has also helped quite a bit. We have a number of collaborators, both at UCSF, Stanford, uh, as well as uh, the Periton team who help us run the data repository uh, to house. Uh, the data sharing efforts that we leave as, uh, lead, as well as the dream group uh, who's helping us organize the uh, crowdsourcing effort to bring the computational community to the data, as well as, of course, the March of Dimes leadership and uh, leadership across all the centers that enable data sharing. Uh, of course, our funding sources. This is our team in February of 2020 when we were all in a single elevator uh, hang, heading out to lunch. And since then we've been mostly on Zoom working remotely, though we do get to see each other occasionally and I'm hoping uh, this will be, will change more and more to more in-person interactions. And with that, I will stop there and I would love to take any questions. That was really wonderful. Thank you, Marina. Um, and as the questions are starting to come in, maybe, maybe I can kick off by asking you, I, I really love that you showed us both the microbiome and its capacity to predict preterm birth, as well as some of the work you're doing with electronic medical records and, and its predictive capacity. And I wonder how much can you improve predictive capacity by integrating those kinds of electronic medical record data with like an objective or multimodal objective uh, microbiome data? How much do your, your models improve with those kinds of, uh, adding those different data modalities into the predictive algorithms? 
So it's a great question. I don't know the answer because we haven't done it yet. Unfortunately, at this time, we don't have microbiome data and clinical data on a large number of samples or a large number of individuals. That's why we sort of tackled them separately and have been going, looking at the features that we identify and kind of trying to get to the biology that way. For instance, in the context of the EHR data, one thing that we've been interested in looking at is uh, exposures to different compounds and different drugs. So then the question is, for instance, somebody who's been on antibiotics, what is, are, is that associated with adverse outcomes like preterm birth? And then kind of linking that on the biology level. However, as we start generating these larger cohorts and the larger data sets, we can really start asking these questions. My gut feeling, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> is that uh, there will be quite a bit of improvement because the features that they learn are so different that I think there will be sort of this kind of additive effect. So we get about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 performance in each one alone. I'm hoping that by bringing them together, we can get potentially a more, more better sensitivity and specificity once we start aggregating. We've seen a little bit when we combine different omics that there is an improvement, mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't been able to link the clinical and the molecular data yet, just because it's not available at, at that scale. It's fascinating to think that, you know, maybe a, a test when you first become pregnant will be a, simply a vaginal microbiota profile. Um, just given that early first trimester data that you showed, I thought it was very compelling. The first question we have is from Valerie Sampson and um, Valerie asks, is anyone studying the different outcomes of informing pregnant women of new therapies directly through media rather than relying on doctors to inform them? And how important is it to educate the public about these new findings? Well, I think it's incredibly important to educate the public, and that's something that we try to do to the best of our ability. Um, we do quite a bit of work in computational drug repurposing, and especially with the pandemic and COVID-19, we've done quite a bit of work in that space as well. And I think we have to tread lightly and tread carefully. Uh, we have to explain exactly how we identify these associations and what are um, so what are the assumptions of our approaches? And uh, again, I look at these efforts, these data-driven efforts as ways to generate hypotheses. And especially in drug repurposing, these drugs are already FDA approved, right? So we have to show um, what exactly we're doing and what, what question we're able to answer with the data that we have and not kind of overstep to... Um, to get to the conclusions that, that might take things too far. Um, I think we have to be careful, but at the same time, I think it's important to understand the power of data and power of asking questions and generating hypotheses. So I think it's, it's, it's a fine line and we, we have to be somewhere in the middle where we're comfortable and also are we're educating the public, but not overselling what we're doing. And that's sort of the balance that we try to find. Yeah, it really speaks to kind of reproducibility and validation and understanding the why, as well as not just the relationship, but why it actually might predict, um, for example, preterm birth seems important. Um, another question from Achillesh Palansami. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, what's your opinion on quantitative PCR versus shotgun metagenome testing of the microbiome? Well, that's a great question. I, I will say I'm not an experimental expert. Maybe Sue has more to say about that. Uh, you know, from the data perspective, I've mostly worked with 16S to date, and there are limitations to it. Uh, shotgun metagenomic sequencing provides a lot more, um, a lot more data and a lot kind of a much richer picture of what we look at. Uh, but in terms of the testing aspect and kind of developing a clinical test that I don't have as much experience with. So I don't know, Sue, if you want to chime in there. Yeah, no, I agree. Like the, the, the PCR-based studies are kind of, you know, 
they're, they're quick and they're easy and they give you a very high resolution profile of an individual. And if you can kind of plug that in as, as you've done, Marina, into a broader population, you get a sense of where individuals are on a gradient. But the shotgun data is, is more computationally intense, but it provides functional features of the microbiome um, that may be more specific and, and maybe even more predictive um, compared to a profile of, of organisms, but then translating that into something that's a prognostic or a diagnostic uh, may take a little bit more effort. And, and we also have to remember that the PCR-based um, approaches go deep into the microbiome. They tell you who's there across a broad array of, array of organisms. The shotgun metagenomic data tends to kind of look at the, the top organisms and their functional genes. And you have to really dig very deep in the sequencing to get all of the organisms that are present represented in that data. So pros and cons to both approaches. While we're waiting for some other questions to come through, I, I was really struck by your finding of uh, Alcinella in the vaginal microbiome associated with preterm birth, because I know that as an organism that calls, uh, causes endodont endodontic mm. um, infections. And I know that there is that link between oral health and preterm birth. Uh, I guess the question is, is twofold. Do you think that oral microbes are translocating to the, uh, across perhaps the, the, the human body during gestation, including to the vaginal tract? Um, and second, do you think the oral microbiome could be a good predictor of um, preterm birth? I mean, does it have to be the vaginal microbiome that is, is that the best predictor? That's a great question. So for some of our collaborators have looked into this, and as I mentioned, the high school project was focused in looking at across body sites. And we've, both our collaborators and ourselves have seen that the second most predictive uh, microbiome um, body site relating to pregnancy outcome is the oral microbiome. In terms of how, like, exactly that those microbes travel and uh, sort of how they transcend across the different body sites that I don't have much insight into. But as we generate more data and or potentially aggregate, we haven't done a meta-analysis in the other body sites. We've only focused on the vaginal microbiome to date. But expanding that and looking across body sites and seeing maybe it is a combination of features from the vaginal microbiome and the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome that will be most predictive. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but this is something to explore. There haven't been too many um, studies that do cross uh, body site analysis in pregnancy, um, but it, it's worthwhile investigating and aggregating those data sets to ask these questions. We can wrap up for the evening. Um, I want to thank you again, Marina, for a really a wonderful talk and you know what the future of biomedical science and, and health sciences look, lo looks like. Uh, really wonderful. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us this evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.